Okay, well, let's pick up where we were and figure out what we're uh, doing. This, as to repeat, is the last lecture of the course, so anything I don't say today, I won't get a chance to say to you. Now, we began the course with a whole bunch of questions from Descartes, and I think by now we've addressed pretty much all of those. Some of them I was rather cursory, so I don't, I, I think uh, that I, I spent a great deal of time on the other minds problem, but I do want to emphasize that my approach differs from the standard approach. The standard approach is more like the Turing test. I, if it can behave like a human being, can answer questions and so on like a human being, I, then it has a human mental life. I think that's mistaken, and that's not how we, in fact, proceed. The way that we solve the other mind's problem is not on the basis of same behavior, therefore same inner mental states, but rather relevantly similar structure that, that uh, underlies and coordinates the behavior, uh, hence relevantly similar causal mechanisms. Uh, in other words, to take a, an interesting test case, why am I so confident that my dog Gilbert is completely conscious? Um, and the standard answer is because he behaves like a conscious beast, and I think that's mistaken. I, we could build, and for all I know somebody may have done it, a robot dog uh, that would wag its tail and bark and do other such things but would have no consciousness at all. The reason that I'm completely confident that Gilbert is conscious is because I can see that he has a, an animal structure. He's got a head and eyes, and uh, I know that there's a brain in there, and ears and mouth and nose and skin and all the rest of it. And I can see that his input-output responses are not only relevantly similar to my own, uh, but in fact they're mediated by relevant similar structures. He sees with his eyes and smells with his nose. Uh, this is why I'm absolutely confident about Gilbert. But when it comes to fleas, I don't know. I don't know what it's like to be a flea or if it's like anything to be a flea. Uh, as I think I may have told you, I have a friend who in investigates uh, uh, termites, and they've only got about 100,000 neurons, and I have no idea. Uh, whether or not they're conscious or what kind of mental life they have. My guess is that consciousness probably goes further down the phylogenetic scale than most people have supposed, simply because it is such an evolutionarily powerful weapon. It gives the animal such a, uh, an increased capacity for coping with the environment. However, that's just speculation on my part. We don't know how the brain does it. We don't know how many neurons it takes uh, to do it, and that just has to wait further investigation. Uh, okay, so if that's the uh, so-called solution to the other mind's problem, uh, there is one additional footnote I want to add to that, and that is I think, in fact, uh, it is a characteristic mistake of our philosophy, our philosophical tradition, that we treat ourselves as if we were all always engaged in epistemic problems, as if I was always going around trying to figure, are they really conscious? Which one's conscious? Which one isn't? I don't. I just take it for granted. I mean, occasionally there's some guy who starts snoring, okay, so he's not conscious. Uh, but I take it for granted uh, that the people in this room are conscious and that the chairs and the tables and the desks are not conscious. It's not, it's part of my background way of coping with the environment that I take consciousness for granted. And if somebody says to me, yeah, but aren't you neglecting the possibility that maybe they're all zombies? Yeah, I am neglecting the possibility. It's not, I don't think it's a, a serious uh, possibility. But it's part of our philosophical tradition uh, that goes back to Descartes that we think our essential cognitive role is to solve knowledge questions, is to, is, is to be constantly engaged in an epistemic enterprise. And I think that's wrong. I think the background is such that when we deal with the environment, most of the things that have obsessed philosophers, we simply take for granted. I take it for granted that this floor is solid, uh, that gravity will continue uh, to operate, uh, that the Earth will continue to rotate. And I'm not busy solving the question, yes, but how do you know? Maybe the floor is not solid. Uh, maybe the future won't resemble the past, et cetera. Yeah, those are always possible. Uh, but part of my background, uh, one of the, and there's an obvious evolutionary advantage to this, is just much more efficient to proceed 
uh, as if I can take these things for granted. Uh, okay, the other, uh, we did spend on the uh, list of Cartesian questions, we did spend a lot of time on the mind-body problem. Uh, and I think you can reasonably expect that there has to be a question in the exam about that. Now, I think, in fact, again, that's a question that's vastly overrated in its importance. I think the structure of intentionality uh, is much more important in understanding issues in the philosophy of mind and how we relate to the environment. And also, the question of the relation between intentionality and consciousness, I think, is vastly more important than the traditional mind-body question. However, uh, I depart from the, the uh, mainstream of the philosophy of mind, and this is a course that ought to familiarize you with the mainstream. So you can expect, I think, uh, reasonably, that there will probably be some question on the exam that will enable you to show your stuff about the mind-body problem. I think. Uh, if, uh, if future generations, if we ever get a satisfactory account of the brain, uh, and I think we will, uh, they will regard our obsession with this question the way we regard the obsession of our great-grandparents with a question whether or not inert matter could be alive just in virtue of chemical processes. Uh, you remember there was a great debate between the mechanists and the vitalists, and it probably went on on this very building or in some earlier predecessor of this building uh, about whether or not you could explain life by mechanical processes. And one school of thought said, mechanists said, yes, in the end it all reduces to chemistry and physics. And another school of thought said, no, you have to have a vital force. It sounds better in French. An élan vital. And that's what infuses inert matter with life. Now we just smile at that. Uh, we can't take it seriously. We cannot feel the passions uh, that our great-grandparents felt about that issue. And I think, I hope, uh, that 100 years from now, People will wonder, well, what was all that they were worried about? Does consciousness really exist? Of course it exists. Is it a natural biological phenomenon? Obviously. Uh, so I'm, I, I am uh, modestly confident that my views are going to prevail, uh, but it takes a lot longer than I, thought it, than I ever thought it would. Uh, and the reason is, obviously, we, we're in the grip of a very powerful historical tradition that says if you've got mental states and they're not reducible to physical states, then you're in bed with Descartes. Uh, then you've got spiritualism, dualism, uh, ghosts running around, the ghosts in the machine. You believe in spooks, as, as uh, David Armstrong once said to me. No, I believe in biology. And it's just a fact about biology uh, that it has produced conscious states like the ones that I'm now experiencing and the ones you're experiencing. I'm pretty confident that view will prevail. One of the reasons I'm confident is uh, that I deal a lot with neurobiologists, with people who actually investigate the brain. They got no problem with this. Yeah, sure, we're conscious. Consciousness is qualitative subjective states. For a long time, they were worried about it because they thought, well, that's not science. And you know, if it's something subjective, it's not science. Uh, leave that to theologians and philosophers, uh, people that we don't take seriously anyway. But nobody, uh, they don't say that anymore. They, they, was, they said that 25 years ago. A lot of um, neurobiologists, perfectly intelligent people, uh, would say, well, okay, so maybe consciousness exists, but it's not a problem for science. Well, nobody says that anymore. And I think I told you the story in my conversation with Ben Libet, where he said, yeah, I, in my field, it's okay to be interested in consciousness, but be sure you get tenure first. Uh, be sure that you've got a permanent job. Uh, and now, I mentioned that in New York, I had a lecture in Columbia, and uh, Eric Kandel, who got a Nobel Prize on this kind of stuff, I, I said, he said, nowadays you can get tenure precisely by worrying about that neurobiology of consciousness. It has now become part of mainstream uh, neurobiology. Now, a, a lot of philosophers think, well, but my God, it can't be real science if it's got this subjectivity, and it can't be a part of uh, science uh, if it isn't reducible uh, to uh, third-person biological phenomena. 
And now, why aren't the uh, neurobiologists more worried about those questions? <laughs> well, partly they just don't know any philosophy. They don't know the philosophy. They never had a course in a philosophy of mind that would teach them uh, to get to lose sleep uh, over uh, uh, questions about uh, reduction. Uh, but I think their attitude is the right attitude, and I think that we have overestimated the importance of the philosophical tradition. Uh, and oddly enough, even people who have refuted the tradition still are in the grip of it. I, I was amazed when Frank Jackson gave up on uh, the what Mary knew argument, and his reasons for giving up are, I, I was looking at the, these uh, sample exam questions, and I quoted him in one of them on an earlier exam uh, to the effect that, well, if you think that um, uh, consciousness is irreducible, uh, that the materialist account uh, I, I cannot deal on materialist terms with consciousness, then you're giving up on science. You're giving up the whole scientific worldview. And as you know, I think that's nonsense. However, you'll have a chance, I hope, uh, to refute me or Jackson or whatever uh, on the final exam. Okay, now, at last time I finished talk, I, I, I ended the lecture talking about the self, but I didn't finish my presentation of my account of the self, and I want to do that just so we have it uh, complete. Before I do that, are there any questions about the overall structure of what we're trying to do? There are several objectives I have in this course. One is I have to teach you uh, the things that worry people in mainstream philosophy of mind. They're worried about the mind-body problem. They're worried about materialism versus dualism. They're worried about computers. And are we really digital computers? And you have to understand that. Mo as I've told you various times, most of them are functionalists. I think the leading view today is some version of functionalism. I think it's obviously mistaken, uh, and I think it's refuted, been refuted by a whole lot of people. Uh, Thomas Nagel's, uh, Tom Nagel's, uh, what it's like to be a bad is probably the most important refutation. But in any case, uh, that's one of my objectives, is you have to learn the mainstream. Secondly, and to me more important, is you have to learn what I think uh, is the right set of questions in the philosophy of mind and what the solution to those is, and that is uh, the problem of intentionality and consciousness. Uh, uh, how is it that consciousness works? Uh, what is intentionality? What's the relation of consciousness and intentionality? And then there are a lot of applications to that, which we uh, dealt with uh, near the end of the course. Free will and determinism is a big question, and I don't have what, I, uh, what at least I don't think I have a satisfactory solution uh, to that. I think that's still up in the air. I don't know how to solve that one. Uh, another uh, a set of problems that we were just talking about, which I'll say more about today, is the self. What exactly, is there something in addition to our bodies and the sequence of our experience that constitutes a self or a person or an I? Uh, is there something about me that makes me me in addition to this body and the sequence of my experiences? And as usual in philosophy, you can't take that question lying down. You have to attack the question. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that next. Any questions at this point? There, yeah, I saw a hand up over here. Yeah. What would be the point of, of, of the philosophy of mind if you had a complete science of the brain? I, I, I think often the way that philosophy proceeds is by kicking the problem upstairs to the sciences. Uh, and I think something like that happens uh, in, the, in the parts of the philosophy of language that most interest me. The stuff that I did in the philosophy of language 50 years ago is, God, was it that long? Yeah, it was. Uh, has now become part of linguistics. It's part of something called pragmatics. So that happens. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen as rapidly in the philosophy of mind as I hope. So let me tell you my own history. I, I quit working on this stuff some years ago because I thought, okay, I solved the problems, uh, the philosophical problems. The uh, philosophical problems, yeah, the, yeah, consciousness is caused by brain processes. It exists in the brain. It's connected to intentionality, and intentionality functions causally. Okay, I solved that. I got an A in that course, and now I'm going gonna, I'm, to I'm gonna do the Chinese room all over and over again for the rest of my life. No, I worked on other things. I wrote a couple of books on 
social uh, ontology, because we still don't understand that. How does, how does the mind create money, property, government, marriage, universities, cocktail parties, fi uh, final exams? And all of those questions have an interesting philosophical grip because they only are what they are because we think that's what they are. But at the same time, it's an objective fact. So these sordid bits of paper that I carry around in my wallet and show off uh, to innocent students. Yes, there it is. I, I, it's just a piece of paper with ink marks on it, yet it's really money. It's not just my opinion that it's money. And, that's, and what, how is it that that can be? How can we create an objective reality of money by way of subjective opinions? Now, you know the first step is to see the ambiguity in the objective-subjective distinction. But that seems to me now a more exciting set of questions, the nature of social ontology. So I wrote a couple of books about social ontology, and I teach a, a course in it. However, the philosophy of mind keeps rearing up. It, a whole lot of issues keep uh, coming up. We still don't, as I said, have a, a solution uh, to the mind-body problem. Uh, I mean, that is, that is biologically satisfying. I, philosophically, I think I can solve it, but biologically, I, there's still a deep question how it works. And they, this a similar bunch of mistakes keeps coming over and over. So I think, I mean, just to give a short answer to your question, philosophical questions are not eternal. What is a major philosophical question can become resolved or it can cease to be uh, the right question to ask or it can be superseded. I hope that will happen with consciousness, that consciousness will uh, become like life, uh, a problem that has a scientific solution. And as I said a few moments ago, nobody takes vitalism, that dispute, seriously anymore. It's hard for us even to feel the passions that people felt about the, dispute, the debate between vitalism and mechanism. I hope that happens to the mind-body problem. But my experience is it just keeps coming up. It won't go away. Uh, and Americans in particular are obsessed by it, uh, partly because religion is much more powerful in the United States than it is in a lot of advanced countries. And people feel somehow or other that this is very important for their religious uh, views, how, how they regard uh, the mind and the soul. Uh, it's an interesting fact that um, uh, Amer Americans are not much worried about social ontology. They take society for granted. Europeans are very worried. I, in the next month, I'm going to give a whole lot of lectures all over Europe, um, uh, from Norway uh, to Italy, including Germany, on uh, social ontology, on how we create society. Now, I'm going to Moscow, guess what? They haven't got there yet. They're still in the, in the mind-body problem. They want me to talk about biological naturalism and the mind-body problem. Okay, so the, the, the short answer to your question is that philosophy often proceeds by kicking problems upstairs, so they become part of a regular scientific investigation. This has taken longer with the mind than I, than I thought it would. It, let's not forget, there was a time when the leading philosophical problem was how in a universe created by a benevolent God can there be so much evil? That was the problem that really drove people, well, I won't say crazy, but uh, uh, led them uh, to produce a very large number of bad books. Uh, maybe that's a form of craziness. A anyway, uh, that's not a problem that has the kind of grip for us that it had on people hundreds of years ago. And I hope we will reach a point uh, where how in a world of physical particles can there be consciousness uh, that that too will cease to be a big deal problem. Okay, that's a good question. Other questions, since this is our last lecture and we're discussing various general points. All right, well, let's finish talking about the self. Now, I said there were two ways of looking at the problem of the uh, self. Uh, one is from the third person point of view, and there uh, the problem is largely about criteria of personal identity. Under what conditions do we say it's the same person? And I suggested there are four criteria, one of which is more or less first personal and three are third personal. And the four criteria are bodily continuity. For practical purposes, that's the most important one. Uh, 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 secondly, 
reasonable transformations, regular transformations in the body. So it's true, you get older, but you don't turn into a flea or an elephant. Uh, so there is a kind of um, a normal transformations of the body. Uh, and then a third, a first personal criterion, continuity of memory. And we do feel that people who have lost their memories entirely have ceased to be the same person. We feel that even from the third person point of view. Uh, and fourth, continuity of personality. That's the least important, but it does figure. However, from the first person point of view, I think there is a different set of questions. And I ended those, with those last time. And there is a question. What, from my point of view, makes me, me? Uh, and is there anything in addition to the sequence of my experiences? Now, the skeptical champion on this is Hume, as he is on causation as well. Uh, and Hume points out, there is no experience of the self, and I think he's right about that. I don't have an experience of the self as I have an experience of this hat. It isn't that there is some entity in my experience that constitutes the self. All the same, for rather subtle reasons, it seems to me we have to postulate a self, and I gave you some arguments for that last time. One argument for the postulation of the self is that you cannot make sense of conscious, rational decision-making except on the assumption that there is an entity, X, which is conscious, capable of thought processes, capable of assessing reasons for action, capable of acting on those reasons, capable of accepting responsibility, uh, and uh, capable of coordinating uh, one set of reasons and actions with other sets of reasons and actions. There's a single entity that does all of those. However, that postulation, I said, unlike what Hume was worried about, is purely formal in the sense that it doesn't specify what the content is. Your, the content can be anything. You can be thinking about whether or not you want to drink a beer or whether or not you want to uh, uh, join the Air Force or what all sorts of things can be part of the content. The point is that you need to postulate a single X to account for uh, uh, the fact that you engage in rational decision making that you initiate and carry out actions, and that you're able to explain your actions by appealing to your reasons. Now, that might seem puzzling, but let me give you the argument for it, the one that impressed me. And that is this. <clears throat> it came out about the issues about determinism. If you think that our reasons for actions, in the, and for example, in the form of beliefs and desires, uh, that if they're sufficient to explain our actions, then it seems puzzling to a lot of philosophers how they can really explain our actions unless the explanation is deterministic. And I mentioned both Tom Nagel and Galen Strawson, both philosophers I respect, who uh, put this argument. And the argument they put is, look, unless our actions were determined uh, by our rational beliefs and desires or by some other cause, then we could not explain our actions by citing our reasons, because an explanation has to explain why the thing that happened had to happen, as opposed to something else which was also possible happening. You have to explain why the thing that happened, not just happened, but it had to happen. It had to follow from the things that explain it. Otherwise, you haven't really explained it, because you didn't say why it happened as opposed to something else that equally well could have happened. Now, when I read that in both of those guys, and they both arrived at it independently, I was struck by the fact that they neglect the first person point of view. I can tell you why I did what I did without my explanation being deterministic in form. I voted, I take, and always, always in philosophy take concrete examples. I voted for Obama for very specific reasons, and I can tell you the reasons I voted on. There are a whole lot of other reasons I did not vote on. I, they might be good reasons, but they're not the ones I acted on. Now, the reason that I voted for Obama is I thought he would have a better domestic policy. I, I know a lot of people thought his foreign policy would be better. It isn't. It's effectively Bush's foreign policy. 
I don't see any interesting difference. But his domestic policy with the health care bill and so on actually is trying to be different. It's trying to be a different policy, and that's why I voted for him. Okay, now is that explanation deterministic? Does it explain why I had to vote for Obama? No, I could have voted for the other guy. I often outrage my friends uh, by voting for people that they think uh, are uh, perfectly awful. I can't tell you how many faculty dinner parties I've ruined uh, by telling who I voted for in the last election. I my God, you know, how could you have voted for him? Anyway, I did. Uh, and I'm perfectly happy to bore people to death by justifying my vote for somebody that everybody else at the dinner party thinks is completely uh, 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 monstrous. Uh, I don't get invited back, incidentally, uh, uh, <laughs> on these occasions. But anyway, I, I can tell you why, who I voted for, why I voted, and yet, now here are the two, here's the puzzle. The explanation is okay, it's perfectly good, why? Because that, in fact, explains it. I know myself why I voted for that guy, and here is uh, the reason that I voted for him, and I know without observation that that was the reason I voted for it. It isn't that I did a careful observation of my behavior and inferred that. No, that's the reason I acted on. Notice that peculiar locution, I acted on that reason. But now, if I have an adequate explanation, and the explanation is not deterministic, if somebody says, yeah, but given that reason, could you have voted for the other guy? Sure, I could have. Nothing prevented me. I might have changed my mind. There was no uh, compulsion or determinism. All the same, I did this for this reason, uh, and it, the explanation is not deterministic. How then does it explain? How can it explain? And I want to say the explanation has a different logical form from the explanation if I explain the collapse of the Oakland Freeway by citing the Loma Prieta earthquake. The form of that explanation is the sequence of causes was causally sufficient to produce this effect. But the form of the explanation, when I say I voted for Obama because I thought he'd have a better domestic policy, that's not of that form. What is its form? The form is a self, namely me, made that reason effective by acting on that reason. Now I said, well, why do I know that's any good? Why do I know it explains anything? And the answer is, it works for me. I'm the guy whose behavior I'm trying to explain, and I can tell you exactly why I did what I did. But if the next philosopher, a philosopher here says, is gonna say, yeah, but how can it work for you? What is the form by which it works for you? And now here comes the next step, and I don't think I had a chance to say this on Tuesday, and that's this. The peculiarity of explanations in terms of reasons is that the reason itself becomes part of the intentional content of the action. That's the key thing to remember. Remember, actions have an intentional content. And the intentional content is in the intention in action, it preceded by, typically by the prior intention, but it's the intention in action. What were you trying to do? And in the case when I voted for Obama, what I was trying to do was improve the domestic situation of the United States by electing Obama. I didn't hope to succeed single-handedly, but that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to improve the economic situation in this country. So the reason the explanation works can be given two, there are two aspects to it. One is, the form of the explanation is to cite a self and the reason that the self acted on. And secondly, the reason that explains is that the reason itself is now part of the action. The reason itself will explain the action because it specifies part of what the action was itself. I'm re-describing the action when I say, I didn't just vote for Obama, but I tried to improve the domestic situation, the economic situation in the United States by voting for Obama. Now, I've never published that, uh, and I, I think I better, uh, so you won't find it in print, but I think it's a, it may be an interesting idea that action explanations from the first point of, uh, person point of view are really quite different from explanations in the natural sciences where you cite causally sufficient conditions. And the explanatory force of the explanation of my own behavior um, has to do with the fact that you're citing a self 
which has a capacity for rationality and acting on its reasons. And secondly, when you specify this reason as opposed to that reason, then what you're doing is citing what the action was. Of course it explains that action, because that reason was part of that very action. Now, if somebody says, yeah, but what about the unconscious? What about self-deception? What about your, uh, your childhood repressions and all those things? Yeah, OK, I agree. There's all of that stuff. And there are cases where afterwards you think, well, I really didn't vote for Obama for that reason. But it was because, well, I had that conversation with a girl in that bar. And well, you know, one thing led to another. OK, I grant you, they're all forms of self-deception. But we can discount those. These are cases where I'm assuming that I have perfect knowledge, where it's not a case of mis uh, being mistaken. Now, it's true. Often with big decisions, you are mistaken. Once I had to make a decision, uh, this was a long time ago, uh, shall I accept a job in a university on the West Coast? I won't tell you its name. Or shall I go to an Ivy League university which has more academic prestige and has a better philosophy department than the, uh, uh, the, than the big university on the West Coast? And I made a list of all the reasons on the left-hand side of the page and the right-hand side of the page. And I wound up, well, on the West Coast. Uh, now, it occurred to me years later, actually, I was always going to go to Berkeley. Uh, that other place, yeah, but who wants to live in? Oh, God. I mean, uh, yes, I had already spent seven years living in, the, in rainy Oxford. And, I, and the, I, I looked in the National Geographic, and they showed photographs of the San Francisco Bay Area. And those may have had an influence on me that I was not fully aware of. So uh, there's an element of self-deception even in our most rational and carefully considered decisions. But the point I'm making now is all the same. There's an element of rationality. And when there is an element of rationality, the specification of rational reason can also explain. OK, one last thought about the self. I have given you a set of arguments why you need to postulate a formal notion of the self. Now, it's not a direct answer to Hume. It doesn't say, well, I have an experience of the self. No, that's not the point. You don't have it. I agree with Hume. You don't have an experience of the self. All the same, and this is an, an, and the next point I want to make, there is something it feels like to be me. Uh, and there is even a continuity in what it feels like to be me. Now, it's hard to show that, but think what it would be like to be somebody radically different. Uh, I think what it would feel like uh, to wake up as Princess Diana on the day that she died, or for that matter, since we're dealing with those folks, uh, as the woman who's going to get married. I re heard on the radio there's some big marriage coming up. I was not invited to the party, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not too worried about it. Uh, uh, what it feels like to be one of the married couple, uh, or the uh, going to be married couple, and it's yes, it's a different sort of uh, experience. I was once introduced to the Pope. Uh, and it was a big deal. Uh, to meet the Pope is a big deal. And everybody else got down on their knees and kissed his ring. Well, I'm sure that's a mark of respect, but I wouldn't get down on my knees for Joe Montana. Uh, and, <laughs> and he is a guy who is who actually at one time seen to me divinely inspired. Uh, I, I don't know. I, the Pope, I told the Pope I thought he was a nice guy and he was doing good work. Uh, and, uh, but in any case, uh, these are cases where you know, I have, I, it takes some imagination to imagine what the hell does it feel like to be pope? I think it must be the most boring job in history. <laughs> uh, well, OK, I, I, since I'm on this, I'll tell you what happened. I, to, in order to meet the pope, I thought, what the hell? When am I going to get a chance to meet a pope? You've got to go and sit through a mass. And I don't like hearing other people talk. Uh, <laughs> So I wasn't sure how I was going to sit through the mass. So I took along a book that I knew I wouldn't otherwise read. It's a book I've always thought I should read, but I never read it. It's called A Critique of Practical Reason by Immanuel Kant. And I, it was a three-hour mass, and I did read the whole, I won't say the whole goddamn book, but the whole, uh, <laughs> the whole book. I read the whole thing. It's one of Kant's weaker works. And now I can't think about uh, the critique about Kant's critique of practical reason without hearing this rhythmic repetition, ora pro nobis, ora pro nobis. This was the background music 
ora pro nobis, to the critique of practical reason. Well, it's not a form of literary experience that I advise you, but it does make an impact on you. I'll never forget that book and meeting the Pope. Uh, anyway, uh, that's irrelevant. I'm, uh, what the, the point I'm trying to make is we need to shift the discussion of the self around. The, the two, pro, two ways of construing the discussion, I think, are mistaken. One is to take the discussion as essentially uh, epistemic. How do we know that I'm really the same guy as the guy who was here last week? And my answers to that, the, my answers to the question about the self have not been epistemic. Uh, they've been ontological. What, what is the nature of the existence of the entity uh, in, in question? And then third, or secondly rather, uh, what is the nature of the phenomenology? Is there a phenomenology of experiencing an entity called the self? And the answer is no. But there is something to the phenomenology in that I don't just have a sequence of experiences but I have them as my experiences. It's me drinking this beer and tasting this wine and skiing this mountain and writing this book. So I have my experiences as part of the continuous sequence of experiences, and they're my experiences even though there is no separate entity which I experience called the self. So I've added two things uh, to the uh, Humean skepticism. One is you need the notion of a self as a formally postulated entity in order to account for rationality. You can't give an account of, of uh, why our uh, explanations of actions are explained. And secondly, there is a characteristic of the uh, phenomenology uh, that's pervasive. But remember, this is not an answer to an epistemic question. This doesn't resolve skepticism. It just describes uh, a character of my experience that I have all of my experiences as part of my continuing sequence of lifetime experiences. They don't just come as neutral events, they come as my experiences. Okay, questions about that? That's a whole lot of stuff I've, I've said there, and it's, a lot of it's controversial. So let's take questions about that. Yeah. The way the subject, what? Yeah. Okay, let me go over that point again, because this is, again, that's a very crucial question. Uh, objectivity and subjectivity are a big deal in our intellectual culture, and I think a great deal of the confusion that surrounds them rests on their systematic ambiguity. There's an epistemic sense of the distinction and an ontological sense. And if philosophers understood that, a whole lot of confusion would have been removed. In the epistemic sense, you need to distinguish different kinds of judgments or claims, some of which can be epistemically ascertained. You can find out uh, objectively if it's true or false. So uh, uh, Rembrandt was born in 1606. That, I take it, is an ob epistemically objective claim. Uh, I, I think it's true, but you can check me up. Uh, that's the point is you can Google that and know the answer to that in, in uh, no time. Uh, so I could be wrong. The point, however, is it's an objective matter of fact. The claim is objective. Uh, and the claim that, uh, whereas the claim that Rembrandt is a better painter than Rubens, I think that's true, but that's subjective. It's a matter of opinion. It's a matter of subjective opinion. Okay, now there's that distinction between different uh, types of claims, those that are objectively ascertainable and those that aren't. Now, in addition to that, there's a sense of the distinction that's ontological. Chairs and, uh, well, let's leave out chairs because they have a functional uh, notion. But take uh, mountains, molecules, and tectonic plates. Those are all ontologically objective because they exist regardless of whether or not anybody's experiencing them. But pains and tickles and itches are ontologically subjective because they only exist insofar as they are experienced. This kind of crap makes a good exam question, you know, uh, about uh, 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 objectivity and subjectivity. Now, one of the points for this discussion, one of the points that this is so important, is that lots of phenomena that are ontologically subjective, like pains, admit of a science which is epistemically objective. 
So the argument that used to be against me in the old days was, well, science is objective and this consciousness is subjective, so there can't be a science of consciousness. You all know why that's a mistake. It confuses two senses of the objective-subjective distinction. Consciousness is ontologically subjective, but that's no reason why you cannot have an epistemically objective science of consciousness, and that's happening right now as we sit here. Uh, an epistemically objective science is emerging. Okay, now the question, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm working up to the question. The question you asked me was, well, doesn't the distinction between objectivity and subjectivity get weakened by the argument that I just gave about the self? Right? I think not. Uh, and I think, the, but you correct me if I'm mistaken, I think the reason is this. The experiences that I have are ontologically subjective. I have cited a formal property of those experiences, namely that I can only make sense out of them, and other people can only make sense out of them, if we suppose that there's one and the same entity that has all of those experiences, is that there's a single X which is conscious reasons on, uh, I, 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 on the basis of considerations, makes decisions, acts on the basis of the decisions, etc. You have to postulate a formal entity. Now, all of that is important for our epistemically objective attitude toward other people and their decision makings. Though the decisions themselves are ontologically subjective, now the entity X which uh, has those, I think is neither subjective nor objective because there's no, I haven't given any substance. It's like the point of view uh, in perception. It isn't that the point of view has to weigh something or has to uh, I, I have a, a certain set of physical properties. It's just that perception comes to me from a point of view. Similarly, I have to postulate a self in order to make sense of my rational behavior. But Though I have these ontologically subjective experiences, on the basis of my rational behavior, other people are then able to make epistemically objective appraisals of my behavior. They can say, this is irrational behavior. Uh, now, there is a, uh, a problem about these uh, third-person appraisals. And that is, you get all sorts of um, uh, ontologically subjective factors get in. So, for example, what seems crazy in one culture might seem like uh, religious or saintly behavior in another culture. Anyway, it's a deep question, and I, I'm going to give the following brief answer to it. The account that I've given of the self doesn't weaken the distinction between ontological subjectivity and uh, objectivity because though there is no ontologi ontologically subjective experience of the self as such, the ontological subjectivity of our experiences require us to postulate a self that has those experiences in order to account for all these logical properties. Now that bears on the third person appraisals that we make where we make epistemically objective appraisals of other people's behavior. We say it's stupid or intelligent, and we can give justifications of those. So the, 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 in, in ontology, the distinction is between mo mountains and molecules and tectonic plates, which are ontologically objective, and pains and tickles and itches, which are ontologically subjective. The self fits neither category comfortably, but it is a formal property of a certain type of ontological subjectivity. It's a formal property of my thought processes and decisions that I have to postulate that they are, uh, I, uh, uh, they are properties of a single entity. Say some more, it's an important question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's again a good question. So let me answer it. The, the, I need the self to, to, to account for certain formal features of rational decision making and action. In fact, I'm not even sure I need the word self for that, but I do need the notion that there is an X that has all these properties. Otherwise, I can't account for the rational coordination. 
Now, why do I need the background in addition? Well, the background in addition is the set of mental capacities. It's a set of brain capacities. It's the, a set of, of abilities of coping uh, that the agent has that enables the agent to act at all or to think at all. So I mean, always nail things down to specific examples. I decide to go skiing even when I'm too busy, I have other obligations, I should I, I really be working on a book or whatever. I decide to go skiing. Why? Well, the snow conditions are exceptionally good. We're just not going to have this again uh, in the near future, and I better take advantage of it while I can. Okay, that's a set of reasons which enables a self to act on a reason and then uh, initiate action. Maybe it was stupid to go skiing then, but I did uh, go skiing. I happened to pick a weekend when there was a tremendous blizzard. Well, thanks a lot. But anyhow, um, I, I, those are the kinds of reasons that, that incline me to think you need to know this formal notion of the self. But now, and this is a separate point, the only way that I could even have those thoughts and perform those actions is I have a set of abilities. I know how to ski, I know how to drive a car, I know uh, how to regulate my uh, time, or so, I sort of know how. And those are, in general, not all of them, but most of those are background abilities. My ability to ski is not a theory that I have, but it's a set of physical skills that I have. So in addition to the notion of the self, you need the notion of the background ability to explain intentionality in general. Okay, other questions about this point? Okay, now that's all I'm gonna say then about the self, and I want, I want you, I, as I said, I haven't designed the exam yet, but there, it seems to me it might be a fun question on the exam to have something about it. the self. Now let me uh, then turn to another issue, and that is where does this discussion lead, the discussion that we've been having? And it seems to me it leads in several directions. Um, if we get an account of the mind and of the relationship between consciousness and intentionality, it seems to me that underlies, that's the basis for an account of language. Uh, and the account that we give of the mind has to show how it's possible that language could have evolved. We don't know, in fact, how language evolved. We know that there was a time uh, in the history of the world when there were a lot of creatures running around that looked sort of like us, and they didn't talk to each other. And then there was a time when they talked to each other, and what happened in between? How did language evolve? We don't really know uh, uh, the answer to that. They're very speculative answers, and, the, and now there's become a sort of cottage industry in speculation. Uh, one of the most influential articles is by uh, Chomsky, Hauser, and a third guy, what's his name? Um, Chomsky, Hauser, and Fitch, thank you. And he's got a wonderful first name, Tecumseh, as in William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, William Tecumseh Sherman is named after an Indian chief, as was uh, Tecumseh Fitch. Chomsky, Hauser, and Fitch wrote an influential article on uh, how language could have evolved. Uh, but still, it's all very speculative. What our question is, given that we have language and given that we have intentionality and that other creatures have uh, intentionality without having a language, what is it that we've got that they don't have? What did we get when we got a language? The short answer is that we got meaning and that means, that forces the question, well, what is meaning? And you now have the tools uh, to answer that. If you leave out the, me the conventional meaning of sentences, and you think of what it is to perform a gesture and mean something by that gesture, then what happens when you make a gesture or bodily movement and mean something by it is you have two sets of intentions the intention to make the bodily movement and which uh, that bodily movement is the condition of satisfaction of your intention and the intention that the bodily movement itself should now have conditions of satisfaction. Uh, if you're trying to tell somebody that it's raining or that you want to, them to come to you by gesturing, then you both intend to produce the gesture 
but you intend that the gesture itself now has further conditions of satisfaction. And to say that is to say that it is meaningful and you impose meaning on things that are not intrinsically intentional by imposing conditions of satisfaction on them. So speaker meaning, the meanings uh, that speakers have when they do something and mean something by it is a natural consequence of what we've been saying in this course. It is the intentional imposition of conditions of satisfaction on conditions of satisfaction. What's the difference between raising your arm and meaning something by it and just raising your arm? The answer is it now has conditions of satisfaction. And you can see this if you imagine cases where you've got an actual sentence, but you don't mean it when you say it. So you're practicing French in the, in the shower, and you say, il pleut, il pleut, il pleut. And the people in the next room get bored with this, and they say, it's not raining, you idiot. You're just standing in the shower. No, you can legitimately say, I didn't mean anything. I was just practicing French pronunciation. But if you go outdoors and it's raining and you say to Pierre and Henriette, il pleut, then you mean something. What's the difference? You said the same thing. What was the difference in the two cases? In one case, in both cases, you intend to produce the French sentence, il pleut. In the second case, you intended that that utterance itself should have further conditions of satisfaction, namely that it's raining. So that's the secret of speaker meaning. Now, what actual languages do is give you the capacity to, have a, 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 to produce meanings using resources that are shared by both you and your audience, by you and the hearers, and those are the conventional meanings of sentences. So when you know a language, you have the capacity to produce an indefinitely large number of sentences. You can keep going with the sentences you can produce. But the sentences now have a conventional meaning that enables you to produce a speech act, to produce a speaker's meaning uh, I, 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 that will be readily communicatable just on the fact that you and your audience share a knowledge of what the words mean. Now, you get other capacities when you get sentences. You can shuffle the intentional state around. So, um, in language, you can just, without language, you can think, I'm hungry. But once you got language, uh, you can think thoughts that are really impossible uh, for a being without language. You can think not just, I'm hungry, but you can think, I'm hungry to eat stewed water buffalo that is baked, I'm sorry for vegetarians in the audience, this will be extremely disgusting, uh, uh, that is baked uh, in Chateau Neuf du Pape uh, over an extremely slow fire. Okay, now my dog Gilbert's a wonderful dog, he cannot have that thought. To, ha I, to have that thought, I've never had that thought till just now, uh, you've got to have a language. You have to have, you, once you've got language, you can shuffle thoughts around in a way that you cannot do without language. There's a guy at the back. Yes. I'm sorry? Yeah, what, well, Gilbert and I have been discussing this issue. Uh, and I teach a course in the philosophy language next semester, and you'll have to report back, because uh, I haven't uh, fully consulted with him. We, we, uh, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, he can have more doggy thoughts than you might suppose. For example, his capacity to recognize people is remarkable. People he hadn't seen in years, he recognizes. Uh, but he cannot think thoughts where the words themselves are part of the content of the thought. See, I can suffer the angst of post-industrial man under late capitalism. I don't, but a lot of my friends think that's a limitation on my part. But Gilbert can't. Gilbert cannot, I think, the life of a dog in late capitalism, pretty alienating uh, and really angst-ridden when you get right down to it. So Gilbert cannot think, I'm suffering the angst of post-industrial canine under late capitalism. He has lots of thoughts. That's not one of them. Now, there are interesting questions as to what is the limit of what you can think without language. Uh, but I think that uh, most of the thoughts that are interesting to us, I, I, I'm going to go to the airport tomorrow and get on an airplane and fly to Morocco and give a speech and all this kind of stuff. I think you can't have those thoughts without a language. Gilbert can think, it sure would be fun to go outdoors 
but he can't think it would be fun to go outdoors next Christmas and maybe go visit the zoo. No, he cannot have those thoughts. So language gives us enormous power, and there's another power that it gives us, which is essentially the foundation of human civilization. Uh, I told you uh, that we have in the mind these different directions of fit, uh, where this is belief and perception. Uh, somebody's trying to tell us something. Stop, it says. <laughs> all right, I got it to stop. That's about, oh, I see, it ran out, all, it ran out of uh, its gas. Well, let's see what we can do. All right. Anyway, you will have this as a background. Um, I, we have these two directions of fit. Uh, where you, the mind represents how we believe things are, that's belief with the mind to world direction of fit, and how we'd like them to be, that's desire with the world to mind direction of fit. But once you have language, you have a remarkable capacity, which other animals don't have, and that is you can make something the case by representing it as being the case. You can have both directions of fit at once, uh, where uh, the chairman of the meeting says the meeting is adjourned and thus makes it the case that the meeting is adjourned. He achieves the, he changes the world to match the words. He achieves world to word direction of fit, but he does it by representing the world as so changed. He changes the world by representing it as being changed. And that is a kind of word magic, but it is pervasive. It's everywhere. Uh, on these bits of paper uh, that I carry around, there's a very mysterious statement. Uh, and all of you have seen this statement. And I want to make sure I quote it exactly if I can get my wallet out of my pocket. It says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. A stunning <coughs> remark because as epistemologists, we all wonder, how do they know? Have they, in fact, done a survey? I, have they done a serious a scientific investigation to discover that is legal tender? And the answer, of course, is they're not reporting a fact, they're creating a fact. They make it the case by declaration that this note is legal tender, thus, they create a reality by representing it as existing, and I call those declarations. Now, you might think, well, that's kind of an oddball case, uh, making something, make, creating a reality by representing it as existing. But in fact, it is the, uh, the basic move by which we create human civilization. You are a citizen of the United States or whatever else you're a citizen of. You're a student in this university. Uh, you own property. You have a, a, a California driver's license. You're married. Uh, you're the, uh, the, uh, the uh, captain of your softball team, or maybe you're just the shortstop on the softball team. All of those are objective facts that are created by declaration. Money, property, government, marriage, summer vacations, lawyers, doctors, cocktail parties, and final exams are all created by declaration. There's a single linguistic operation that underlies uh, the structure of human civilization. So growing out of the material in this course, remember I told you at the beginning, the essential problem in philosophy is to try to give an account of the human reality that makes it not only consistent with the more basic reality described by physics and chemistry, but shows how it's a natural consequence, shows how it fits in. And that's, in a way, what we've been doing. We've been doing the first step of that. If you can give an account of the mind as a biological phenomenon, phenomenon then you're on the way to giving an account of language as an extension of prelinguistic biological capacities. And once you have an account of language, once you can show how we represent reality by creating meanings, by uh, performing acts 
which have conditions of satisfaction imposed on conditions of satisfaction. They have this special double level of intentionality. Then once you have that, you can show how we now have the resources to explain the structure of human civilization. Why do we do this? Why do we create money and property and government and marriage and all the rest of it? And the answer is it increases our power enormously, not only positive powers, but negative powers. If you find a yellow sheet of paper on your car window, that is an institutional fact. That fact is a speech act created by declaration, and it gives you a negative power. It's called a parking ticket, uh, and it gives you an obligation to pay, I don't know, it's too much money now, like $48 or something to the city of Berkeley. But this is typical of human civilization, is it is a system of power relations created and maintained in their existence by a single type of speech act. Now, how does that work? What's going on in those cases? And the answer to that is that we have the ability to impose functions on objects. So uh, this piece of uh, chalk is able to perform a function on these things in their way can perform certain functions. They open doors. But those functions are performed in virtue of physical structure. The key works because it's got a physical structure that matches the lock. But now there are a whole lot of functions, and really enormous number of functions, which work not in virtue of the physical structure or the person or the entity in question, but in virtue of the fact that we have created a status. And the function works because there is a collective recognition or acceptance of the status. So it isn't just a little booklet. It's my passport. It's not just a piece of plastic, it's my driver's license. And because we have accepted the status that is accorded to, these, accorded to these, they perform a function which they cannot perform in virtue of their physical structure. See, that dollar bill, I, five dollar bill I showed off, isn't money in virtue of its physical structure. Physical structure doesn't make it valuable. What makes it valuable is that we have, by collective intentionality, come to recognize such objects as money. And that means they have a certain type of power. They create rights, duties. If, you have, if you're enmeshed in these systems whereby you have money, uh, but you also have loans and debts and a bank account and all the rest of it, you're enmeshed in a system of power. And the power works to make civilization work because the powers in question give people reasons for action their obligations, duties, requirements, and they give them reasons for action which are independent of their immediate inclinations. See, Gilbert can only act on his immediate inclinations. What you do when you train a doggy is to try to give him inclinations that he wouldn't otherwise have. And you do it by bribery. You give him something to eat. Uh, but human beings can act on reasons which don't appeal to their immediate inclinations. They do it now because they realize they're under an obligation to do it or it's required for something else that they want. And all of this, I want to say, again, is a natural outgrowth of the material we've been talking about in this course. Intentionality creates collective intentionality. Collective intentionality creates language, where language is a system of conventional devices that enable you to impose conditions of satisfaction on conditions of satisfaction. And when you are able to do that, you're then able to do something quite remarkable and only, as far as I know, only humans can do this. Other animals have languages of a sort. The bees have a kind of a language and, and uh, uh, the dolphins are all sorts of science fiction accounts of how the dolphins are talking to each other. Nobody has income tax except us. And nobody has money, property, a government, and marriages, and mortgages, and interest rates except us. And that's because this, we have this amazing capacity to create a reality, and thus, really, to create human civilization by representing it with a certain form of speech act. OK, I'm sorry I don't have time to I'll tell you more about this. But anyway, you will have time to discuss all of these uh, other questions on the exam. Uh, I'll be back from North Africa in time.